Hi. Hi. So um, I'm back again, and today is, um, I think it's June uh, 25th, and I haven't been here for a while. I've just been busy, like, collecting information and uh, talking to people about bipolar and uh, bipolar disorder, and it's quite a, been a lot of information. So um, one of the things I want to talk about today are um, older people that... Um, back in the day who were bipolar. Um, Van Gogh, as we all know, uh, was bipolar, severely bipolar, had um, huge manic episodes when he was, was in the euphoria state. He would just do beautiful mad uh, paintings of gorgeous, brightly colored, beautiful starry nights, flowers, all kinds of things. But then when he was depressed, he would, you know, his brother Theo would take care of him and uh, he would be severely depressed until he came out of it. He had bouts of um, manic and um, euphoria. Also, Nina Simone. Nina Simone was uh, wonderfully gifted. And um, when she did not get into the Curtis Institute in uh, Philadelphia, uh, she wanted to be a classical uh, artist. And when she didn't get in, she uh, went into jazz. But her later life, uh, she fell into you know, extreme depression and she, it turns out that she was bipolar and uh, of course you know, she had a career uh, but uh, she was terribly depressed most of the time and she didn't have high highs. She was a depressive uh, bipolar. Also Alvin Ailey, um, he was bipolar and uh, he was a wonderful dancer and he got his creativity out um, by dancing and that's how a lot of uh, people that are bipolar who are extremely talented, extremely intelligent get their creativity, they deal with uh, their disorder by being extremely creative. And so we get these wonderful artists uh, who do amazing things when they're in a manic phase of uh, their bipolar episodes. Um, Winston Churchill wrote 43 books while he was in his lifetime, and he won a Nobel uh, Prize in 1953 uh, for writing books, but he, and this is when he couldn't sleep at night uh, because he was up all the time. But then he had these depressive moods where he would be depressed and down, and that's the part that you didn't see. But he was bipolar as well. Anybody who writes 43 books, and, and brilliant books, um, you know, that says something about who he was and how well respected he, he was. Um, so, some of the uh, most creative uh, artists of our time, Jackson Pollock is one of them, who uh, just created all kinds of beautiful uh, artwork. Uh, and he was bipolar and his manic episodes, he would just like paint all kinds of abstract, beautiful art. And um, so this is what I want to say about bipolar. Okay, bipolar is, is very, very serious. A lot of people need medication when they're, when they're bipolar. Um, the list of medications, I'm just going to uh, run off a couple of uh, medications that doctors are prescribing right now because they just don't know. Everybody is different. Everybody's DNA is different. Everybody's blood type. Everybody's brain wiring. Everything is just different for everybody. So some of the, um, the drugs that they are prescribing are, and you could actually go and, and try like five or six of these before you find one that works. So you're going to recognize some of these names if you're bipolar or if any of your family members are bipolar or been diagnosed or whatever. So Abilify, Neurotin, Lamecto, Lithium, Zyprecta, Seroquel, Resperdal, Topamax, uh, Depakote, Effexor, Prozac, Lexapro, and that's only 12. I just wrote those down because I was just going down a list. But there's so many drugs that you have to try and they have to be also in combination with other drugs because the comorbidity of um, bipolar, 61% of people that have bipolar disorder, 61% have a comorbidity with their bipolar. The comorbidities that most people have are um, 
simple phobias. They have phobias. Now the list of phobias, a phobia is an anxiety disorder. So if you have anxiety, uh, that's just one. You could have panic attacks is, is, a, is an anxiety disorder. But if you have a phobia, like if you're like extremely afraid of like spiders and you see spiders, but and you're afraid for your life and you won't go near a spider, it disrupts your life. That is a, you need to see a doctor about that phobia because that's, you need to be diagnosed from that because that's disrupting your life. If you have a phobia, there are other areas in your in your life that you have some other disorder that you need to address, like ADHD or some other kind of d disorder. So people that have phobias usually have two or three phobias besides being afraid of, of spiders. You might be f afraid of heights. You might be claustrophobic, but phobias have to be diagnosed because they disrupt your life you think your life is in danger, you cannot deal with it, you would do anything you can to avoid whatever that phobia is. So there are a lot of things that go along with this. So um, along with uh, uh, being bipolar, the thing is, is that everybody's got something. And this is why the stigma has to go away from people talking about being bipolar, and especially black people. I, I went on to um, Instagram and I tapped the hashtag bipolar. I didn't see any black people. It's like a, a million zillion posts of people doing all kinds of things and talking about bipolar, but black people will not talk about mental illness. And we don't know why. Black people won't go to the doctor. Uh, black men won't go to the doctor. They won't talk about their mental health. They won't do anything. And so, um, and we and we need help because it's disrupting our culture, it's disrupting our our cycle, it's disrupting our lives. If there's no communication, there's no understanding. There's there's a total breakdown in our family, in our culture, in everything. If we're not talking about this in our relationships, in our in our marriage, you know, how, how are you going to talk to each other if all of a sudden you're talking about something and then you just stop? You just stop and somebody walks out of the room. You have to have some understanding and some compassion and let that person say what it is that they need to say without judging them. Whatever it is, just, just let them say it. it. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. It's about what they need to say about themselves, whatever it is. Even if they're accusing you of something that's not true, let them say it. You don't have to respond, just let them say it. Because you have to talk and let people get out what it is that they need to say. Black people especially have been suppressed from being able to say what they need to say. And this is generational from the beginning. To be shut down, not to talk. Don't read, don't write, don't get an education. Whatever it is, we're the first generation to go to college. We still have black people, like we're the first ones to go to college. We are the first ones to get our high school diplomas. Still the first ones this, the first ones that. This is generational. So the bipolar thing is we have to understand and we're living in a time right now where everything is a freaking trigger, a trigger. Bipolar disorder, is a trigger when someone has an episode it is because something happened and a trigger has set them off it doesn't have to be an immediate trigger at that moment but it could be could have been something that happened previously and it's all about trauma trauma is the thing so when somebody is mentally ill when they go to a psychiatrist they sit down and talk to you they don't go oh my god What's wrong with you? That's not what they say. They know something is not right with them. They ask, what happened to you? What happened to you? Because they know that any kind of mental state that a person in that is not normal, something happened to them in their past that is making them that way. So I'm going to go over something that happened. Um, I'm just going to go over... Um, for me, okay, so 
they call then they have a name for it now it's called ACE ACE which is just um, adverse childhood um, adverse childhood um, ex experiences and we just call this abuse childhood abuse now they have a name for it and you can actually go online and take a test it's called the ACE test and you can see how much what your score is and how many things that you have that um, that could cause you to have a trigger for any of these things and this is what they are trauma okay so those who experience abuse one physical abuse emotional abuse household dysfunction uh, any kind of abuse incarceration and divorce as a child are likely to face higher rates of smoking alcohol and drug use they are likely to be overweight and chronically late for work how about that chronically late for work overweight and chronically late for work how, how do you figure that in what happens in the brain that people that are abused in childhood are overweight and chronically late for work so there's something going on that they know about childhood abuse and trauma with a bipolar disorder and mental illness has something to do with this these are triggers so I looked at the ACE score and I looked at how many of the things that that happened to me so by the time I was um, uh, let's see I, by the time I was seven years old I had physical abuse I had emotional abuse I had household dysfunction mental illness in my family domestic abuse in the family uh, and divorce as a child this was all before the age of seven Okay, so um, bipolar, all these things are set in by the age of seven. Once you're seven years old, your personality is set in. So if I had all of these things already set in, I would like to know um, who I turned out to be as a person, my personality development, who I turned out to be from seven years old with all of these things happening in my life before the age of seven okay so my trauma is fight or flight okay so constantly moving from home to home just always moving I have always moved um, I started moving when I was born as soon as I was born my mother started moving because she divorced my father as soon as I was born I was the third one so she was divorcing him so we moved from Virginia to Philadelphia when we got to Philadelphia we moved from Gorgas Lane to Talpa Hawkins Street from Talpa Hawkins Street to uh, Magnolia Street where she married my stepfather which meant I went to a new family and had a new family and a new stepfather and then my birth father uh, while I was living there I was like six or seven years old he told me that he was moving to Texas and never coming back and this is before I was seven and um, so I had moved five times before I was 12 years old and then after we moved from Magnolia Street we moved to Crittenden Street so by the time I was 12 years I had moved five times so this had become a pattern with me for my entire life Whenever any anxiety, any any anxiety happened with me, anything, I would pack my stuff and just move. Just pack up and leave. No explanation, no nothing. Just pack up and leave and never know why. Just out of my mind, pack up and leave. So I've had like a million addresses. So it's nothing for me to, I'm a packing expert now. I can help you pack and pack up in like 10 minutes and have your house all gone, packed up, whatever. Call me. So, um, during this time uh, when I was uh, between being born and seven years old, there was domestic violence in my family. Um, there was physical abuse because every time I got a report card, this is when I was in the first grade, I flunked the first grade. Um, I got a beating every time. So by the time I was uh, seven years old, I had a couple of beatings just for getting a bad report card. Um, and also my father 
had uh, brought us to Philadelphia and he left my mom in a house um, with no food, no heat, and lived around the corner with another woman and a big house down the street around the corner, had a baby with her and used to take us over there to her house and then bring us back to the cold house with no food and no heat. So even though I didn't think anything of it, that was traumatizing. And then he would fight with my mother and my mother would come out of the house with an ashtray in her hand and he would drive down the street and she would take the ashtray and throw it at the car. And we would watch this. We would watch them fight like that. Throwing the ashtray at the car, trying to break his car car window out. So I remember just sitting there like around f four or five years old, watching them fight like that and then going over to his house. It, it, it was just insane. So um, by that time, uh, I was just, it was just, it was just dysfunctional, but I didn't know it. That's how I started out my life. My whole, my life started that way. And I continued that, um, that trauma and that, that dysfunction my entire life. And that goes into your subconscious. When it goes into your subconscious, it's locked in by seven. It's like down packed in there and you don't even know that it's there. But what happens is, is that you form your personality around that. All those things that happen, you form your personality around all these things that happen to you and you start to protect yourself from those things. You don't know how you're acting, but it eventually shows up by your actions and your reactions to things that happen to you. It's how you react to things. That's how it shows up. So, um... It's a vicious cycle and it's already been set. And then what shows up as you, as a wake up call, it shows up as being who you are as a person. Your subconscious shows up as your personality, as who you are from the time that you're seven years old. So, if you if you haven't had any, uh, if you're like um, 25, 26 years old and you get married, you haven't had any uh, counseling or anything like that, and uh, you've grown up with abuse, any kind of abuse, physical, emotional, you know, um, any kind of abuse, you're stuck in a seven-year-old, and when you're fighting with your spouse or whatever, you're, you're 27 years old, but you're a seven-year-old fighting with that person because you're coming from a seven-year-old subconscious mindset. You might as well be seven. That person who has been abandoned, who was poor, who was cold, hungry, having nowhere to go, you're fighting with that person, that seven-year-old. That's where that conversation is coming from. And it makes no sense to your partner because your partner doesn't know anything about what happened to you. So this is why it's really important to understand what trauma does. Trauma sets into your memory, into your every cell. And that's why you, when you go to therapy, they ask you, what happened to you? They go, oh, you know, how was, you know, how was it growing up? You know, what did your mother do? What did your father do? What was your life like? Blah, blah, blah. They ask you those questions to get to the bottom of what the trauma was and what is triggering that. Because you're always going to be, someone's always going to push your buttons about something and you have to pull back and get yourself together. You have to constantly flex your muscle all the time. It's not like it goes away. You can be spiritually enlightened, you can get to a higher level, you can get to more understanding, you can get to a place where you have, you're here and you know that that's not you and you know that you have more control over your mind, your thoughts, your actions, how to respond, know what happened to you and know that that's not you as a person. But when something comes up and, it, and it's unexpected, that's the trigger that throws you off and you all of a sudden go back to that seven-year-old, that three-year-old, that five-year-old. And you have to regroup and get yourself together. Because you just have to 
get that calmness back. You have to go, no, that's not me. That's not what's happening here. I just had a memory. I just had a memory, but that's not who I am. Remembering who I am is the person that knows that all those things that happened just happened. That's it. That, that doesn't make me who I am right now. This who I am right now is not that person. That's I'm not that seven-year-old. So this is what's difficult for me um, right now. Uh, my mom passed away uh, five years ago, this year, 2007, uh, 2022. She passed away September 12, 2017. And um, the fallout from, from my mom passing away was disastrous um, for me. I was her caretaker. And, um, and the, the family matter, the things that happened, I, I didn't understand. I, I couldn't understand what happened. And because I didn't understand what happened, I took a dive, I took a nose dive into this bipolar abyss that was just insane. It was insane for me. And I could not uh, control it no matter what I did. However, I knew I had tools. I had a tool bag of things that I could constantly pull from to keep myself on track because I knew that if I didn't, it would not end very well for me. I knew that because I could feel it. So over the last five years, it's been uh, up and down. It's been day by day, but I'm really good now because I have been doing my spiritual studies. I listen to um, Michael Beckwith, who's awesome. And he's on every Sunday, but I listen to all of his stuff. I've been following him since 2007. Uh, personal development courses that I've used, I pulled out all the tools, all my spiritual books, I meditate, um, I pray, I, I do all kinds of things. When I feel like I cannot do this. And there are days when I wake up and I say, I can't do this. I can't. And when I feel like that, I go outside, I sit outside, right outside of my apartment, and I meditate. I just close my eyes and put my face to the sun. And I say, this is not who you are, Winter. And yes, you can. Because you're a survivor. You did this. You took care of your mom, you took care of everybody, you took care of everything. You did it like a pro, you did really well, and you're okay. But bipolar runs in families. It is genetic and it is trigger happy. It does not discriminate. So if somebody calls me and has a conversation and they say something to me and they say something that might trigger some kind of emotion about something that happened in my family or like five years ago or with that situation, I have to remember not to respond and not to react. And I have to calm myself down because I have to be in control of my mind and my thoughts. And that's what everybody has to do with anything that they're doing. But if you have an anxiety problem, like you, you get anxious and you have a phobia and, 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 you're, and you just get like crazy, you know when you have that phobia, you have to walk away and calm down. You have to go somewhere and go, I got to get out of here. I got I to go somewhere and breathe. I have to calm down. People that have not been treated for their phobias need to go get treated because they have other comorbidities that go along with that that are hindering their lives. That they're, they're stuck somewhere that they don't even know where they're stuck. And there's a list of phobias that is extensive. And the psychopathology around phobias is extensive. So everybody's got something. You know, there's like autism on the autism spectrum from very low functioning to very high functioning to Asperger's. Asperger's, the, the spectrum is like the rainbow. It's just like a color wheel. A color wheel 
And then there's like a zillion different colors of the spectrum of autism and, and Asperger's. So everybody's got something going on. So bipolar is no different than your phobia of what you have from being afraid of whatever it is that you're afraid of that seems so irrational to the person sitting next to you. They're like, you're scared of what? Why would you be afraid of that? But it's something in you that needs to be addressed because it's so irrational that you don't even know why it's irrational. So I would never judge somebody for having a phobia. When I go to get an MRI, they go, oh, do you need a sedative before you go into the machine? I'm like, no, I don't need a sedative to go in there. And because people get claustrophobic by going into something that covers them completely up. I just go right in. I fell asleep during an MRI the last time I got an MRI. They had to wake me up. And the thing was making all kinds of noise and everything. And I fell right to sleep. Other people cannot go in. They have to sedate them to go inside of an MRI machine. for Like this was for the head. So um, I'm saying that to say uh, wh whoever is in your family and uh, whoever your friends are, you have to start talking about understanding. I wrote something in, um, in 1972 called Mr. Franny and Coconut, and it was about understanding. That's what the whole, it's a little short story, but it was about understanding. I didn't even mention the word love in there, but it was about pe if people understood, if they took the time to just understand a person and accept them, for who they are, just accept it. That's it. Accept who they are. It will just eliminate so many problems because you can let that person communicate who they are and what they want, what their needs are, what, whatever it is. Just understand that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything to let a person talk. You don't have to respond. Just because somebody wants to say something, if you don't like it, you know what you can do? You can walk away. You can say, oh, that, I'm, I'm not into that. You know, that's not my flavor. You know, see you later. Or you can say, oh, that's okay. You know, I'm that way too. I have the same thing. You know, I feel that way too. You know, come on, be in my tribe. You know, you, you form your tribe with the people that do the same things that you like. Don't be in a tribe where you feel uncomfortable where you're not yourself, where you can't be the person you want to be, dress like you want, have the hair that you want, the clothes that you want, be the weirdo that you want to be. Find the same weirdo that you are and be with the group of weirdos and y'all be together. Find those people, find your tribe and be who they are, but don't be in a group that's not for you or like you or try to fit in. Don't be the square that wants to fit into a hole, a circle. Don't do that. If you're that person, get out of that and move to another, to the square, and get into the square group where the square fits into the square. That's where you belong. You were not put in this world to be understood. Everybody is unique. Everybody is different. Every snowflake is different. Every water drop is different. Everything is different. Everyone is unique. So you're not to, meant to be understood. Everybody says, oh, I'm misunderstood. Nobody understands me. You're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be unique. Everybody's DNA is different. So be your misunderstood self with your misunderstood group that's vibing all together so that everybody can say, you know what, we're, we're all the same. I get you, you know, I do that too. We all do the same thing. There's nothing wrong with anybody. People that need to be on medication have a chemical imbalance and when they go off balance, they need to have something so that they can get back to themselves so that they can function in society. If they become disruptive, they can hurt themselves or hurt someone else until they get back on track. So that's when people need medication. So it's necessary. 
they're also foods. All the food that we eat, every the processed food that we eat have so many chemicals in them. They make they make me itch. They actually make me itch. I ate a bag of chips something the other day, and I usually don't eat chips. There was some kind of, there, there were some kind of corn chips. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are really good. So I ate another bag, it was small. And I actually started itching. I could feel my body tingling. Like, like I had something running through my veins. And I was like, oh my God. Processed food is one of the worst things you can eat. So go to like um, Produce Junction. Farmers markets are expensive. If you can afford to go to a farmers market and buy organic, then do that. If you can't, just go to Produce Junction, get your vegetables. You can blanch them, put them in the freezer, whatever. But start eating fresh vegetables, whole foods, and stop buying anything that's packaged and processed. Start slow. Start slow. But then start to eat that because that's going to change the chemical composition of the cells in your body. It's your nutrition. It's your brain. It's your heart. It's your heart-brain math thing going on. So you got to get that together. Okay? So let's see. What else do I have here? Um, I think that's about it. So we just talked about what happens when, like, even bef before you're seven years old. So you got to think about... What happened to you by the time you were seven years old and how your personality was formed and what you did to protect yourself? My thing was that um, I became a personal servant. Oh my gosh. Being nice, being kind, doing things for everybody, being this nice person and in my family, especially catering to my, uh, my stepfather. Oh my gosh. He told me one time I was doing nice stuff for him. He looked at me and said, you know what? You should have been a waitress. I looked at him and I said, really? And I thought to myself, I was really insulted that he said, you should have been a waitress instead of, thank you for getting me a glass of ice water. Instead of, thank you, he said, you should have been a waitress. So anyway, um, think about, you know, the things that people say to you that you think are, are offensive, how it hits you. I took that personally, and he probably didn't mean it personally, but that's how I took it because of all the abuse that I took all of my life growing up from people saying shit like that to me all the time because I was so nice and they would say things to me and I would never say anything back. So, but now, now that I know and people say things like that, it rolls off my back because I don't take it personally. So, um, okay, um, also, um, the, other, the other things that go along with bipolar disorder, uh, disorder are ADD, ADHD, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, um, anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder um, has, uh, phob has um, what do you call it, panic attacks. So if you have panic attacks, that's under anxiety. And the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, also uh, PTSD, um, and also substance, substance abuse. They call it substance, substance use, substance use disorder now. Instead of calling you a drug addict, it's substance use disorder because they know that if you are a drug addict, you're a drug addict because you're stuffing down all the stuff that happened in your past and you're numbing yourself. So they have a new name for it, which is good because maybe you'll get treatment. So um, also narcissistic disorder, um, antisocial disorder, um, histrionic disorder, and um, eating disorders. So anorexia, binge eating, and uh, emotional eating. I do emotional eating. Like at night, um, I can't go to sleep without like eating a bag of popcorn. Eat, I, I, I make my own. I cook it on the stove. And I have to have something to eat before I go to bed. And I swear it's because when I was little and we were poor and we, were, we didn't have anything to eat before we went to bed, I always have to have something to eat before I go to bed. Nothing heavy, but I just have to like munch on something 
before I go to bed. That is emotional eating. So, um, another thing, people don't comment on somebody else's body size. Don't say things like, um, I see you gained a little bit of weight. Really, why would you say that to somebody? They know they gained weight. Who wants to gain weight and be fat? Why would you say, oh, I see you gained some weight. You put on a little weight. Why would you say that? Or, oh, I see you lost a few pounds and not in a nice way. Like, oh my gosh, girl, you look good. You know, you lost, you, know, so you look really good. You know, how are things going? Not like, I see you lost a few pounds. You've been really skinny. Like, um, like you're a crackhead or um, like you're on drugs or whatever. People say things like that and it feels awful to the person you're saying this to because you don't know what kind of drama is going on in their lives. You don't know what's happening to them or what's going on with them that they gained weight or lost weight or whatever it is. And for people to say things like that to you, it's, uh, it's hurtful. They say things like, when are you going to put some meat on those bones? You don't know if that person is, uh, is, is food insufficient, that they don't have money to buy food. You don't know what their situation is. You know, they may have lost everything and don't have any money to buy food. And they're just like going from day to day trying to get food. And you walk up to them and say, when are you going to put some meat on those bones? You've really gotten skinny. What's going on? Your clothes are falling off. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. Don't talk about people's weight and their body weight. It's none of your business what's going on. Okay? Because you don't know what somebody else's story is or what they're going through. Okay? So, um, knowing what to say and knowing what somebody is going through, just be patient. Just be patient. Ask somebody if they need help. And if you see somebody that they're not looking good, you know, say, how are you doing? Say, you know, what, do you need some help? Can I help you with something? Do you need a ride somewhere? You know, can I take you somewhere? Uh, what do you need? What do you need? What, whatever. If they say nothing, just ask, say, are you sure? You know, just let me know. Here's my number. Call me if you need anything. Or give me your number so I can check on you. But everybody's got something going on. Everybody. So let's stop avoiding the stigma of taking bipolar and making it this huge thing so that people can talk about it and especially men and their mental health. I know uh, none of the guys go to the doctor. Why do black men not go to the doctor? Why do they not want to go and get anything checked? Oh, I'm just going to, if I get some, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to get cancer and die. I'm not going to the doctor. How insane is that? Please stop. Think about your family. Think about your children. Think about yourself. Think about yourself. It starts with yourself and self-love and self-care. It took me a long time to do that. And I'm still working on it. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I'm still here to think about it. Care about it. And so, um, I don't think I told you in the beginning, if this is the first time somebody is like tuning in, that um, I was d diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2009, but I knew something was wrong when I was a teenager. Um, my comorbidities are ADHD since the first grade, because I used to daydream and look out of the window. Um, I was, wasn't diagnosed until 2009 because I had um, bipolar migraines. I had migraines so bad that I lost everything. I lost my home, my car, my house. I lost everything. I lost my job, everything. And they finally put me in the hospital, got me on the right medication, and they said, you're bipolar, and uh, blah, 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 and here I am. So, I'm also dyslexic, and um, I have dyscalculia, which is the inability to calculate as well. So I just carry a calculator around with me, and I just like call it a day. And um, 
uh, anxiety and depression. I have anxiety and um, that that gets bad sometimes and I start pacing the floor and then I have to like get myself together and calm myself down. Um, I have uh, chronic migraines that I still get treated for and uh, but they have them under control. I also have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome because uh, I started getting that when I moved into the house on, when my mom remarried. I started getting stomach aches then. I would get, and the doctor used to give me paragoric. And I found out what paragoric is. If any of you guys ever had paragoric, paragoric was a form of opium. They used to give that to kids when they were young, but it would stop the spasms in my stomach. I was always uncomfortable around people when I was um, younger, even when I was in high school and I would go to parties and everybody thought that I was having a really good time, I had stomach cramps the entire time, always, always. So, um, and that's lasted for my entire lifetime. Bipolar doesn't go away, it stays with you for a lifetime. You always have to work on it, you always have to flex that muscle every day, every hour. And um, so, I just, oh, another guy who uh, is bipolar, who was bipolar, is the guy who did the scream. You know, the scream painting where he's like, ah, and it's, and it's uh, an emoji now. His name is Edward Munch, and he is bipolar. And he, um, that scream, that is a visual hallucination that he used to have. That's where the scream came from. In his head, he was screaming all the time, and that's where the scream came from. Little known fact. So, um, there's some books that are, are interesting to read. One is called Touched by Fire, which I have, that I've read, which is absolutely amazing. Also, there's a movie that uh, Forrest Whitaker did called uh, repentance and this he produced this movie and he said that he did it because he was trying to explain loss pain healing and the core of humanity of tortured souls and it's about a person who is bipolar tortured souls and he's absolutely right it's torture being bipolar fucking hell that's torture so anyway there's also Silver Linings Playback, and you guys know about that. That was Bradley Cooper. And also uh, The Informant, Matt Damon, a star in that. And um, there's some other ones, Mad Love with Drew Barrymore. But there's lots of movies that, you know, people are, are you know, talking about, um, about bipolar. So, okay, let's just like, you know, demystify bipolar. There's a lot that goes with it. There's so much. You can go on psychiatrist, I think it's psych, psychiatrist.com. Oh, psychi psychiatric times, right? You can Google psychiatric times and then search for comorbidity for bipolar disorder. There's so much information. When you see how extensive it is, you're gonna go, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is like, wow. So, hopefully you'll do a little bit of research, you check out your own phobias, you'll check out other people's behavior, you'll start checking out people around you, and have some empathy and some kindness and compassion for people that are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, any kind of other label, because we're not our labels, we're none of those things. In fact, we're all brilliant, we're all talented, we're all just geniuses, we've got so many so much talent it's just incredible so just ignore just ignore whatever label anybody gives you we just go for whatever we do best you know whatever we do best just go for it and just do it okay that's what most people do anyway so um i'm just going to leave you with um this last thing and that my prayer for you and for for everyone and myself my prayer is that we all reach for the tallest tree, the brightest star, and for whatever makes you feel good in your heart and your heart's desire, I want you to go for it and do it and know that there's nothing wrong with you. I want you to get help, seek help. I want you to find happiness because it's there within you. It is inside of you. There's the God within you that is in you. 
that can heal you, that you can start with inside yourself for a new beginning for your life. Help yourself to go forward to get things going. So I wish you love and light, peace and joy. I'm Winter Chapman, Bipolar Bizarre Bizarre. Okay, now let's find the clicker. I think I'm gonna click it three times and see if it works. Let's see, hold it this way.